call our special workshops to order. Could we just stand and pledge allegiance to the flag? Let's pretend. 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 Let's p
or even the after school program, it was a matter of priority about what we might be moving during the day. But with the bunk, with the new budget proposal, um, when we put into play the possibility of having full day kindergarten over a three year period at all of our schools, really enhances and extends what we need to do to help us reduce that in, that the gap of our students, and it's good for all students. So in three years, with that added uh, possibility, it really makes a difference in terms of what we can do. Um, so as I look at how we can deal with programs after school or before school, that needs to go into our uh, thinking. We've had wraparound programs for a number of years. We've extended the day. We've done many things in order to get to full day kindergarten. Well, this gives us a structured opportunity for all our kids to have it over three years while we build on the things that we do in readiness and head start so it would not make much sense for us at least as you make your decision on this budget to put a proposal together that's going to go to the commissioner that has that outside of your uh, context when you request 1.7 so with that in mind what am i saying here's what i'm saying that i think we need to look at head start in a different venue and um, here's how I think we can do it. If you look at the sheet I gave you, the major difference, if you look at Cigna, um, I need to thank Ed publicly here. He has been working tremendously on trying to bring that number down. You may recall the original number that we had for uh, Cigna and our insurance was somewhere in the city of 12%. At the last conversation I had with you, we were down to, I think, 5%. Um, currently, with as of this morning at 11.30, after Ed had uh, talked to them a few times, um, it looks as though the budget that we will need is about 1.64%. Is that correct, Ed? That, yes, 1.6. Well, uh, most down, right? 14, so. But that gives us an added, you know, $770,000. Now, the reason why they sharpen their pencils is one, he's a good negotiator, number two, we put out to bid two areas for our, um, there's a, now a state system, and there is also Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I think they, they being Sigma, know that we, they were, we were competing, they were competing, and some years back we did change from um, Sigma to Blue Cross at one time, then we went from Blue Cross to Sigma. And I think they value our business because this has allowed them to have more business in the area, a presence as they call it. So with that, they came back with um, quite a number. So that number of 770,000 really makes a difference on our bottom line. In addition, retirees, at one time, uh, we didn't even know we'd have five. Right now, it looks like we're gonna have 10. So as you know, we do our replacements, we use a number. It doesn't always come out one to one, one, no, but it's a, an average of about $40,000 of savings per person. So you add that on from five to 10, that adds quite a bit more money. So if you look at the, um, if you look at our bottom line at $4,650,000 in order to make our budget, which would give us a budget of 1.04% from the city, my suggestion is that um, we, we, we remove those items in here that we had a value added, which would go to the, um, to the special grant from the city that we would um, we, we think that there would be a budget offset from this year from our savings we have a one percent savings account we've done a projection to the end of the year if everything moves along the way it is we should have a savings and we've asked the city if we can utilize that savings in the past we've given it back in a lot of ways but if we can utilize that and the answer is yes the Sigma savings of seven hundred seventy thousand. We believe we could save the bus contract of the busing if we don't have to add the two buses at 150. And that's what we hope we can do. Um, the interns, we can. We believe we could save off of our, um, our expenses that we've been using for subs about 100,000. The computer lease, that is the money we have in here to lease. The city has indicated to us that they've been willing to fund a. Um, a bond to do that, provided they do that, we do not need to put the 160 in there. The big difference here is that we talked about Head Start. Um, what I'd like you to do is, is look at this second page here. And these are the, this is the page of the cuts. 
And on there, if you turn to the last page, it's in green. It looks like at the last page, it's in green. It says update the readiness classes. And it says reduction to head start harm. The initial proposal, as I indicated, was 195 because of the context of taking so much away from the school. And look at a system of phasing out while we um, find some way of, of keeping the program. I know it sounds like we're talking out of both sides of our mouths, but here's what I mean. Is over the next two to five years, I think we can transition from, we give about 585,000 to a new model of funding some local contribution with new grants to minimize the impact of the budget. Jim has indicated that over the next few years, we can look at trying to increase the amount of money we had uh, that we come out of our operation with. Being that we're able to get that added money from the insurance company, being that we have that many more folks that are uh, retiring, I suggest that the cut to, the, to um, Ted Stock only uh, be at $50,000. In, a different, in addition, um, I have removed the, um, the pay to participate across the board because, of, uh, I, in my view, the problems in collecting and the equity and all that, I don't think we believe that we need to do it. This still maintains the teacher ratio um, when we applied for the $1.7 million. And as you know, the thing that I was skeptical about, and I appreciate the mayor publicly saying this, that if, in fact, there's an issue with the 1.7, that the city would assist us in making us whole. That is a big insurance policy we did not know, you know, four weeks ago. When you put all that together, working collaboratively, um, I think we could meet we could meet our budget out of, uh, uh, obligations by making these cuts uh, and still keeping our programs whole. And the beauty of this is, we get to 1.7 and we start building on our SIOP, the readiness program, the Head Start program with the full day kindergarten um, and uh, some increasing bilingual programs, doubling bilingual programs and some of our regular programs in high school, we're gonna start really impacting our, our instructional gap uh, that the money is, uh, is set aside to do. So um, before I end, I hope I didn't confuse you very, very much, but it looks as though the added money from Cigna, we've been able to reinstitute the Head Start and start a phase, instead of phasing Head Start out, we phase into a try to mutually look for grants so that we can keep that program whole. Because I think the commission will be looking for that for us to build on. I think we should then leave the pay to participate out of the cuts because we have ample money to handle the difference. So Bill and Ed, do you have anything to add to that? No. No? No. Oh, okay. Bill? <laughs> no? Bookends. Bookends? Okay. Uh, with that, I, I'll turn it over to either uh, our chairman of the finance or over to uh, Gladys. At this time, have, does any board members have any questions that they want to have answered this particular time? Mr. Janelle? It should be on. Thank you. Um, one, I think the, the, the job that the administration and Ed has done on the insurance, because that's been a filler for us, is, is, is excellent. I just want to make sure that this is locked in number. That yes, because at 1130 they uh, called us and it's locked in. The $160,000 that we have. Is this contingent to it being passed by the residents in terms of a, a referendum? So if it's not passed, it will be put back in the budget? Uh, we don't know if they're going to go to a referendum. It's, uh, remember, it's a six-year plan, uh, and they were figuring on a, on a ladder of about $500,000 a year. The state was going to bond it for us? I think so, yes. Great. Um, the other question now, what is the acronym SIOP, I've been struggling with that. I missed it before. The SHELP, S-I-O-P? Right. Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol. That's a SIOP, uh, that's a, a professional development model that teaches in here. It's one that we've been uh, working on the last three or four years with our uh, teachers. Okay. The, 
Although we can skate this year, which I'm very grateful for, as opposed to looking for having to do with cuts that we had proposed as of the last couple of meetings. As I said before, year after year, we sit here, we do the same thing. This is probably one of the better years that we've had in the last five years in terms of mitigating the cuts that aren't really laying off people uh, or doing away with programs. But I still feel that collectively, we've got to get together with the community and get the business people involved in the school system here, not necessarily to fund us for money, but to have them understand what we are doing in Danbury, what the value of education in Danbury is, what our students mean to them, and to have them be part of the educational process. As well as, and I know this year, uh, the administration are working closer with the, with the council people, with the, the, uh, the mayor and his office, but we need them as well to be, to be part of some of the challenges and, and the solutions we have, because I'm afraid next year that, again, we know the insurance companies, they want to salvage something this year, but next year may be back at the same 10% game we negotiate. We have to do something to look at the revenue side. And I keep making reference to that ECS funding and alluding to the fact that we're about what Mark was doing. But I think we have to continue to, to, to look in that vein so we can look at the revenue side and see what we can do to make sure there's money coming in and not always continuing to cut. Uh, once we continue to cut, you're going to get to a point of diminishing returns. And so that's what I'm concerned about, I think, for later discussion or maybe part of the community relations. We should look to, to get together with the different stakeholders in the city to try to make our educational system stronger and to make them more aware of the challenges that, that we're faced with each year. So and I want to thank you for the efforts and, and the good work that you've done. Thank you. Mr. Tavisak. Um, looking at the uh, statement here of the supplementing of future aid uh, to head start by grants, are those grants available or is this pie in the sky? Uh, I'm just thinking that, okay, what, luckily and basically through your skill I uh, you were able to get this insurance uh, thing, but as Mr. Ginelli said, okay, so we may get by the funding thing this time. Uh, because of that, but it just looks to me like we're going to be in the same, we may be in the same situation again next year. So I'm, I don't know. Uh, is there enough funding to keep the program of uh, well, I, I think I think on grants, on grants. I well, I don't know the answer to that, but let me tell you what I do know. I think this board needs to come around their own philosophical view about the importance of our programming beyond the norm today. My, what I am saying to you is that if, if you have access to $1.7 million and we were to remove this program from our, from our programming requirements, you would not access the 1.7 because it is a major um, strategy to close the achievement gap. The reason why I'm saying that, as we apply for grants to make us eligible, we receive the Nellie May grant, right or wrong and different, because there are things that are going on in Danbury that other communities may be interested across the board. We were eligible for 300,000. We've been told that we might be able to get, you know, close to 900,000. If there's grants out there, it just puts us in the light that we are doing these things. Therefore, it makes us much more attractive to receive grants. Number one. Number two, just operationally, if in fact the reform moved forward from the governor's office, if it goes forward, the new, there's been a negotiations done. There's added seats for readiness programs. It says that for the 15 schools, you know there's a, there's a co-op of schools, network of schools that are needed, and we're part of that. There's actually 20. 15 of them may qualify for more readiness seats. In addition to the seats that were in the original proposal, it looks like there's going to be more seats available because of the interest of the legislature, legislators and the governor to have early, you know, pre, um, universal preschool for all students. The, the cutoff is that you have a 40% um, free and reduced lunch count. Well, 
four years ago, we didn't qualify, but guess what? We now qualify. So now we have the possibility of accessing two or three more classrooms. Well, if I start bar trusting that up to a head start, we start decreasing the amount of money we have for the 550, while we keep adding the number of kids to post achievement. So it is in a way a factual, but it is a, you know, it's a mosaic that you've got to put it together. So there's money out there and you get where's the end need? Yeah, you, you look all the time while you're mining for grants, you know, and there's money, but they look at us in, in, in ways that makes it attractive for them to come to us, doesn't it? So Bob, I guess it's a goal. It doesn't say concretely that we can do it, but it's our goal that we should try to actively get grants to, to keep the program, grow the program, in light of a full day kindergarten, we'll be able to do something. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I so I want to make it clear that I'm all, I'm all for, uh, you know, continuing the program. What uh, my question was getting at is, okay, so we're settling in here, we could not the the problem in the future, that's all. I'm all for it. I think people know that I, all, I really believe it's so important to have the you know, education program is the stuff. But it's just a question of, I was just wondering, okay, we're sol solving it now, but we hope it's come up again in the future. I hope not, because like I said, I hope, I hope what you're saying about the cell works out. Well, there's a line in the sand here. If we put in um, a conditional grant to close the achievement gap, which by the way, I know the governor's kind of, it's, it's a five-year grant, you know, I know he's got a re-election. Um, you can't turn around and just say, I'm going to remove that. Now, you're making a commitment. To That's why I say there needs to be a philosophical discussion. The board says, you know, Sal, keep teachers in classrooms. We've done that. Keep head stuff. We, we need to do that. That's the kind. That's a decision you all have to make. We all know the boards. I'm saying we have an opportunity we didn't know we had four weeks ago, and we have we have we have some money that we can put into here while we mine the other thing. Jim is out here. Do you think we have a chance to get some grants to help us? Uh, if you don't mind me asking the question, I thought go ahead, Jim. I think the answer is yes. Uh, realistically, I, I, I have consulted with the superintendent. I think the answer is yes. Um, the uh, two different aspects of it. Uh, one is that the 1.7 may turn into 1.75, okay, uh, or some other number, and we would like to talk about that, and then we could fully restore the Head Start cut, if at all possible. Um, the legislation is still being worked on. And there are Head Start proponents at the Capitol who are trying to make sure the legislation works well with Head Start. Okay? Now that's item, item number one. So I think there's some possibility there. Yes. Okay. Item number two is specifically what the superintendent referred to, which is the school readiness program. The governor proposed 500. The last I heard, the legislature was looking at about 900. Now that number isn't fixed because the bill isn't resolved yet, but they're, they're looking at more. If there were more school readiness slots that were available, that certainly would help. I, I want to be very careful about this, though. There's a big difference between school readiness and Head Start, okay? School readiness is the education component. Head Start is the education component and the family development component, right? So how we would use school readiness slots to substitute for what amounts to Head Start slots if there were further cuts in Head Start, that would have to be negotiated with the regional office in Boston. So it's not just like dollars, you know, dollar here, dollar there. Because in effect, the Head Start program does more than the school readiness program does, and the Boston Head Start office would have to be part of that conversation. But bottom line, I agree with the superintendent's analysis that it is possible to, to support the Head Start program with grants, and it's not entirely um, blue sky. I, I, think, I think there is a reasonable, uh, realistic approach to do it, certainly at the $50,000 level. At the $200,000 level, uh-uh, not happening, okay? But at the $50,000 level, I do think we can make that transition. And hopefully we can even avoid the 50000 depending on what the final number comes with the, the uh, improvement plan money. Jim, I have, no, okay. we, have seen, we have some money. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have I have some
some difficulties with this, only because I don't think we can look at this and look at the rest of our schools and say that this is a perfect world. In a perfect world, we love to fund all the programs. I think if we don't have some sort of plan in place for Head Start to be more self-sufficient, that will continue to use our local funds, that takes away for funding also for our K through 12. Now, we, we have middle schoolers who have multiple study halls. We have high schoolers that have multiple study halls. We have not very good technology. We have lots and lots of things where we need to focus as well. And I think that federal and state has said that, you know, it's a federally and state funded program. And we need to work and coincide with you. I think it's a wonderful program. I think it's terrific. And, and as I said, in a perfect world, I think it would be great. But I think that um, we're also neglecting the rest of our student body, the 10,600 students that we have. Um, and I think that um, we need to have a plan. We need to have a short-term and a long-term plan of our relationship with Head Start and how we're going to proceed um, in the future. Jim, I had a question, but first I'm going to um, kind of uh, respond in, in a way also. I think you're absolutely right, Sandy. I think total proponents of the program, as well as those who may have some question relative to before and after, are going to end up on the same page on this board. I really, you know what I mean? I think that Head Start knows that, that if there was a transitional way to federally fund and whatever, we'd be okay. But I need to ask you a point blank question. I haven't understood a lot of this. What's the 50000 going to do to your program next year? Well, um, first, first, it's actually going to be, if that's what goes forward, okay, we end up with that $50,000 cut. It's $50,000 cut on your side of the budget, okay? What that means is there'll have to be a cut since all you fund is personnel, right? Please be clear, all of the Board of Education's money is for personnel, okay? So if you're gonna reduce that amount by $50,000, there's gonna be a reduction in personnel. Right? We need, and again, this goes to the conversation I had with the superintendent, we need to have a discussion about how that happens. There are a variety of ways that could happen. For example, we could lay off some of the program helpers. Uh, last year, we reduced that number by about half. Now, you could reduce it a little bit more. You could eliminate a teaching position, okay? You, you have to ultimately make that decision because that's your decision to make. We have asked to be consulted about that, and we would like to be consulted about that. Bottom line is, our obligation is to continue to run the program. And so what we would have to do is we would have to, in effect, come up with that $50,000 and cut on the parent component side of the program somehow, okay? So that's a very difficult thing to do, just as it's difficult for you to do on your side. But between the two organizations, between the Board of Education and Head Start program, we'd have to negotiate out a solution to that problem. And I'm not here, I cannot tell you was chilly in tonight, you know, what the answer is. Hope, as I said, I hope there is no answer in the sense that I hope it's not a million seven, I hope it's a million seven five, okay? But if there is a need, then we will in good faith find an answer. And, and the reason I can stand here and say, uh, and the Head Start people haven't heard me say this, um, that, you know, the 50,000 we understand isn't because we think you should cut Head Start. It's because we want you to know that we are partners with you and you're facing difficulties, and we're going to face those difficulties with you, right? But there isn't any magic. There's not going to be any big federal increase, right? There's maybe no federal. Many years, there's none. There's certainly going to be no state increase in Head Start specifically, right? And to be clear, Head Start is a state, federal, and local program. It isn't just a federal program. It is a state, federal, and local program, okay? So we'll have to work that out. That's my best answer. Can I just say that according to our information, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, our expenditures in 2009-10 budget versus 2011-12 budget, benefits have gone up from $332,000 to $785,000. Humongous. I, I, I can't say yes or no because that's not under our control. 
that's under your control. Those are your increases, your budget approvals, your fringe benefit approvals, etc. So then it's our local decision. It's our decision collectively. So when you approve, when you approve contracts, that's what you're doing. Uh, Mr. Hobbs, yeah. again, along the same line, right. and, and in regard to Head Start, I just had two questions. It seems as though the federal as well as the state funding for Head Start has been stagnant over the past five years. That's, that's correct. Uh, so what's the, what steps have, have been taken to get more? Well, um, the Board of Ed's funding has been basically stagnant. The increases have come by the increases in your costs. Okay, on our side of the budget, we've done everything we can. We have eliminated positions. We've made changes administratively. We've moved more of our administrative costs to other programs as we grew. Head Start is part of the Connecticut Institute for Communities. So, for example, when we added the um, health center to the Connecticut Institute for Communities, we were able to shift some costs from administration from Head Start to the health center. So, we have found ways of negotiating our way through what amounts to uh, steady funding with no increases, but increases in costs. Because we have increases in costs too. We, we do have a health program, right? We pay electricity bills, we have supply costs, inflation. So we've been pushed by the increases too. We've managed our resources to hold the program together. And, and as a federally funded, federally, federally state and local funded program, I mean, a question that I get proposed is that why is my kindergarten child have 22 children per class, yet Head Start is mandated at 10 per, 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 per instructor, per, per you know? Yeah, Head, per Start, Head Start is mandated at, at 10, 10 children per um, staff person. The, the answer is age difference. Early Head Start is mandated one staff person for four kids because you can't take care of 10 kids in diapers that need to be bottle fed or breastfed or other things going on. So it's a state licensing, okay? State licensing is one adult for four kids in early Head Start. Now the Board of Ed doesn't put any money into early Head Start. You make space available, we're very grateful, but that's not part of the budget discussion. Um, at Head Start, the state requirement is one adult per 10 kids. And that's true, by the way, not just for Head Start, that's true for all early uh, preschool programs. So uh, uh, the school readiness program, private daycare centers, et cetera, it's one to 10. And it's because of the age of the children and how much attention children younger need. Is, can, can any adjustment be made to that number, possibly one to 12? The state could. The state could change its regulations, yes. Um, I, I don't think you'll find many educators that think that would be a very good idea. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a question for Dr. South. You um, handed this long sheet of legal size paper and you talked about the elimination of full day kindergarten programming and the history was last year you cut all of your paraprofessionals? Is that accurate? Dr. Um, I go, what this is, this the history when we cut the aids? I don't know if it was last year or year before. Okay. It was so it was two I, years ago? I can, it was in the summer of 2010, and there were a couple that were excluded, for example, at the Magnet School, but for the most part, that's right. And can you tell me how many staff members were cut? from the kindergarten classrooms? I want to say the number was about 16, but I have looked at it two years ago. Okay, so 16 people were cut two years ago. Correct. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I thought it, I, I, if it's 16, I'm not okay. sure. Okay, so I, just my question is, the money that we're saving from Cigna, um, what was your thinking process when you decided to fund back, if you will, um, from the original budget reductions on 411, which was Head Start was being reduced by 195, and now it's being reduced by 50,000. What was your thinking when you thought that and thought you still have kindergarten classrooms with 20 to 23 students and still without a paraprofessional? Why did you choose that and not putting some paraprofessionals back into your kindergarten classrooms? 
Just want to know why you're thinking that. Fair question. Um, this is not done in a vacuum. And the decision was made regarding the kindergarten aides. It was done with the administrators present. Um, you know, the, the research, and I don't think you're going to get an agreement on the research about uh, keeping teachers versus um, keeping aides. The difference is put the money in keeping the teachers, not the aides, although the aides are beneficial. So we made the decision a few years ago to reduce the, um, the, the teachers, I'm sorry, the aides. The year before, two years before, we had two literacy individuals. We reduced one literacy to begin with. So there's one literacy person at the elementary school. Two years later, when we got into this budget, started the budget lows, we, st we started looking at areas that we were going to have to reduce that were crucial. And that was one of the recommendations before the board. The recommendation was either we reduce uh, we the full day kindergarten to half time, everyone to keep the aids, or we go the other way. We decided to keep the full day kindergarten and reduce the aids. When I made the decision, uh, when we started talking about the, you know, before and after school stuff. I met with the administrators, and we talked about their program in terms of where we would have to look at possible reductions. Their feeling at that time was that if, in fact, we're going to have to further reduce our elementary resources, further reduce. The, you got to remember the, the part time, the uh, the aides were not part of the discussion at this point. Then we really have to we're really concerned about the value added that Head Start gives us versus us having to go back to maybe half day kindergarten, um, you know, universal half day kindergarten, maybe reducing some of our instructional aids, literacy people, some of our math people. We didn't want to go there. So rather than do that, you saw the recommendation that I put on the table. Since then, since the conditional funding mechanism is operationalized by the governor, who says clearly that if you're going to use this funding, to add value to our program to close the achievement gap, one of the criteria he's going to look at to approve the $1.7 million is class size reduction, which would be the added people that we have in there for the new for the enrollment. Secondly, to build on to our gap closing activities of preschool. So therefore, our, our interventions of preschool and full day kindergarten. We do not have full day kindergarten. So now we have a plan for full day kindergarten. It builds on our readiness program and it builds on our early head start. It just made sense to me that to put us in the best position to do what's right for our kids, we ought to move down that direction. Okay. That's the only way uh, I've done it the way I've seen it. So then closing the achievement gap and you said reducing class size would not an aid in a classroom, in a kindergarten classroom, reduce class size, thus closing the achievement gap? You know what? Um, yes and no. We, we got to remember now. When we when we had an aide in the classroom, it, it typically was um, very. Good. These were good people who were very good bottom of teachers. There was always a main teacher in there and an aide, so it was two with the 20 kids or 22 students. Uh, so it didn't reduce size. It just reduced the dependency on the teacher. Those of you who teach kindergarten know to do all that other stuff, which was valuable. Of course it is. Yeah, I understand. But when we looked at the research, the research was uh, explicit and, and pretty plain uh, that the teacher was, I hate to use this, more important, say more effective than having the aid present. And still, when we presented to the, to the board, we presented two options. The option that the, um, the, that, uh, the board selected was, uh, was to uh, reduce the aid, correct, Bill? And I can't remember what ours was. I don't remember if we said keep the teachers now. I Possibility of universal I can't hear you. Universal half-day K was not the other option. Okay. So I don't think it reduced the size. It just reduces the kind of dependency. Plus, the um, full-day kindergarten, the, the aides were in there uh, between teachers. They weren't exclusively for the uh, for, for each kindergarten. The other things um, that wasn't in here was the option of going to full-day kindergarten in the whole district. If we can, if we have an opportunity to put a, a program together that's going to have full day kindergarten, uh, I didn't even remotely think that was possible a few years ago when we made that recommendation. So I think this, for me, the best of both, both worlds, to be, and that was my rationale. And the research you're, you're quoting, do you remember 
where that came from. No, I, you know, I, I got to believe this is star work that's done. I, I'd have to find it. I'm sure we could, you can Google it for me somewhere and find that. Uh, it kind of is almost counterintuitive in terms of my experiences, uh, you know, where we had AIDS and we had to live in there. But the actual research says the teachers are much more effective than having AIDS. If you have a chance to add AIDS or teachers, add the teachers. Yeah. I'm not saying they're not useful or help by any means, but they are. Yeah, two, uh, two board meetings ago, I guess I can address this to Ed and Joe if you don't mind. Two, two board meetings ago, uh, again, we're looking to transition to full day kindergarten within a three year period. And it's estimated that 151 students are going to be added for 2012-2013 in terms of full day kindergarten. It's going to be, if you took March 1st numbers, it's 165. So now 165. Correct. March 1st numbers. And uh, that is all budgeted and salaried and expensed within this existing budget. Correct. Well, it's, it's the, uh, the 1.7 item. So it's tied into the 1.7? Correct. Okay. If you look on the second page, we'll take it on to 2000. Okay. And, and Diana, the difference here that, that what I'm saying to you I, is that my fear, you probably, would, I don't know if you'd be seeing the same recommendation here, if I had an indication that we didn't have a chance for the 1.7 million dollars. You know, even if the governor, for some reason, this doesn't come to fruition, I think what I heard from the city is that they, they would support what we're doing. Now, you need to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. That, in, that when you put that into play, that's why you see what, 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 um, what you have before you. Um, and Joe, when you did the numbers, we did it strategically where we had space, because we have some space issues as well. We did it in a three-phase plan. But is, is $350,000 sufficient? I mean, you're speaking about 165 students at 22 per class, so basically eight, eight teachers, it, right? It's, it's five teachers that were that included in the $350,000. But why only five if we're adding 162 students? Well, some of those areas already don't have have 16 kids or 12 kids or 11 kids. Okay. Our, our maximum uh, uh, is 22 kids in, in a couple of uh, areas. There are 16, 17, 20, and so forth. So there's, there's no 26. So, as a, so, so, the so the redistribution is basically only five new teachers as far as we're concerned. Correct. 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 Good. Thank you. Two things, um, totally switching. Uh, Ed, uh, you've done a great job, but I'd also like to know what our consultant, whom we pay money, I don't know how much, has done to assist you in these negotiations. Every year, in my experience, we start with a huge increase and go through agita for months and months to get down to what is real. And I'm really kind of sick of the game. Um, if we have to play it, we have to play it. But uh, I don't want to name our consultant because he's a really good guy. But I mean, what kind of assistance did you get oh, for our dollars? Uh, <laughs> we both worked hard. Uh, we've been in constant contact. He's the only one besides my wife has my cell number. <laughs> I don't give that out. So no, we've been in constant contact. Uh, we met with probably Cigna five times in my office. Uh, uh, also, again, we've had the state down once for four hours, uh, and uh, we went out to bid with Blue Cross. So uh, we have uh, our fiduciary responsibility to the fiscal uh, people of, Tony, of Danbury has been uh, done, and I think uh, both of us did a great job. Okay, just one other question. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> just, and uh, just tell my wife that. Okay. It's, the other thing is, it's my understanding, and this may be incorrect, yeah. that the state plan um, that is out there now by, by a movement of statute, um, municipalities such as us can enroll in, was sent out by the controller directly to the superintendent. And the superintendent was to amass the information and directly re uh, return it to the comptroller's office. Why? Simply and honestly to avoid consultants. So I guess I'm asking, was our consultant involved in the state process of ascertaining what the cost would be to us? Yes, he was. 
Okay. May I ask why? Well, we work together. You know, I mean, uh, he has some knowledge, I have some knowledge. We put the knowledge together and we work on it together. You know, it's two heads of men and one. And, and, uh, and did the quote come from the Comptroller's office or from? Um, Controller's office. Oh, okay. Thank you. And we, you know, even though they sent the, uh, 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 submitted a quote, uh, when we met with them for four hours, we had uh, 15 questions that they're still waiting, we're still waiting to answer. They have to answer 12 of those ready. So. Okay. Uh, you should just. Got it. Okay, this is a question that's totally off the subject. Um, value added. I I need it to be spelled out. I, I mean, I had a list of all the things that were going to be cut. So, but my list added up to seven hundred to seventy-six thousand, and we're doing uh, six ninety. Can you? Tell me what is in that value added. Okay. Um, the value added, the, the term is simply used because it's going to enhance the programs that we have. What you see on the second page right here is that uh, we want to move forward. What I've asked Dr. Glass to do is to develop a uh, detailed plan that would encompass all of that 1.7 million plus some other program that we're looking at. So it's hard for me to, you know, it's not, it just won't come down exact, what's exact um, in terms of the budget space would be what's on the front page in terms of reduction to get down to the four set, four six. If you turn the page, we know all the kindergarten will be roughly around 350. Now, I may hire a teacher for more or less, I don't know. Someone may take an insurance policy where someone doesn't. So that's, that's just a ballpark number. The interns, we know because it's with the university that we pay that money. The full-time teachers at 560. All right, no, I, I actually so understand I the second page. All right. Um, I guess what I'm confused about is, um, remember that list where we were gonna put in back the half-time nurse? But that value-added list is not on this, it's not on anything. It's one of the things I was doing. No. Weeks and weeks ago. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Well, yeah. And the list and the right. title is value added. Correct. Correct. And we have um, the things that were added on that yeah, value added. Yeah, the in town, the textbooks, Correct. the nerd. Are those in or out? That's what I want to know. Right. Those are out. No, well, they're not. They're out. They're out. Right. The things that are in is what the, Dr. the uh, class has talked about: school improvement. All right. Uh, so we don't have the part-time nurse. Correct. Well, that part-time nurse. Uh, we are working with our Medicaid funding uh, with IEP Direct that we'll be able to probably fund that under Medicaid. And uh, what about the custodian? Custodian's out. The uh, director of the reinstitute, the tech coordinator is out. Districtwide Power School is out. The curriculum development is out. And those are, some of those are into in the 1.7. Uh, the staff development. It is out, but it's, some of that is in the 1.7. Gifted and talented is in the budget of 15.9. Textbooks are out. Okay, so. So maybe I need to update that. that yes. I'm yes. sorry, and now I know what you mean. Yes. I got, I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Yeah, I got I'm sorry. So we'll update that. I'll we'll update that for you. I got you now. Okay. I misunderstood. We were doing, we were, we've been culling this thing so many times, I apologize. No. No. I just want to answer something to the board. Um, you just said something about the nurse. We do have funds in the district that um, we collect in certain areas, so we're able to move some funds over. So we took, we did, we, we, do, we, we need the nurse, we, we have the nurse in, but we'll update some of the other stuff, okay? So, thank you. Mr. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Shelton. Yeah. I read a column in this Sunday's paper by one of these people who covers the capital who said something to the effect that SB 24 is in the coffin ready to pull it through. But you heard anything to that effect? I, I was at a rec room <laughs> myself. I think um, what you hear is a lot of full busting going on from both sides. Um, 
as recent as yesterday, the governor spoke uh, yeah, yesterday at, 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 a, at a group where he's indicated, you know, how he feels about the, um, the budget, um, the reform. I also have a sheet of paper to give you during a regular board meeting about the updating, the differences between the two. I don't think it's dead. I think that there is, uh, I said again, that there is no question Connecticut is at a tipping point. We have the largest uh, the gap uh, achievement. Gap. Something's going to happen. The belief of it's not going to happen the way the governor has laid out the blueprint, and it's not going to happen the way I think the legislators have laid out the blueprint. I just wrote all the legislators yesterday with a, with a proposal that's kind of moderate, saying when you look at these things, look at these items as you negotiate. It will be a negotiated budget going forward. The, the, the flying the ointment has been the, the, the 10 year stuff, and uh, not so much the budget stuff, the budgeting stuff, but it's been the 10 year and certification that they need to come around. And the authority of uh, the commissioner on turning around the district and the lowest, the lowest schools, not school districts in the state, but the lowest 15 schools in the district. Some in the, in the state, something's gonna happen. So I don't think, I don't think the nails are being, you know, hammered in there. I think it would be a transparent corporate, but it, parts of it will die, parts of it will live. And parts of it will go to a horse to build a camel. It'll go to the committee. Yeah. Is what's going to happen. Okay, so, uh, but you think the 1.7 is, is fairly safe for a good portion of it? Because to answer your original question, I do see a couple city guys over here that the, that the mayor was guaranteed 1.7, okay. but I think that's assuming we came up with a little short, maybe a 1.4. I well, I, I don't want to assume it. I can't assume it. I think that's my, I said, that's my worry. You know, and I think that Mark has to step to the table and say, you know what? First of all, our budget from the city indicates it's one, one million and three. Okay. Well, if you step back and look at it, it's $900,000 of new money. It's about $300,000 of, remember that the fund in the district that's, that we have, um, that the orders said that needs to be expended really is it sits on the city side. That's 200,000 they're permitting us to use. He's also not charging us for the mowing of the lawns and stuff that we did. That's 200,000 more. We also have $400,000 that if we're mindful of how we spend money to go to a 1% account for a week in the end, that's 1.9. I think the city is, they're helping us. And I hear Dick and he's right. But I think we all are dealing within this grandiose puzzle to make it work. So we, we're moving forward with good momentum. Then the mayor says, look, you know what? And I heard him say, you guys were there. If, if this doesn't come to fruition, you know, I'll make you whole. He went up to the governor's office last Thursday, Friday, and when he called and said, I met with him. We're going to have to go up and meet with the commissioner to Sandy's point because you think it is relevant here in terms of how you take care when you, when you have um, you don't know what's going to happen with the before school and spending the money. That in order for us to get the conditional funding, which he believes will be there, and this is the governor telling the cities, he believes it's going to be there, you got to do A, B, and C. That's why we need to modify the conditional funding. So when you put that all in, in, in I think the, 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 the mayor is committed to helping us get to the lake kindergarten, keep the class sizes down, keeping Head Start whole, doing the things that we need to do. So I think that's the best thing I can, I can answer for. I don't, I don't know any other way to say it. Thank you. Um, under the value added, you had mentioned Power School. And I thought that that was a state mandate now that you needed to report data. And so I'm concerned, how is it now something we can cut? No, we, it's now the ops, the special ed. So we're buying, it's, it's on the cut and we're buying out of this year's budget. It's Naviance, it's a software package. Yeah. Anyway, so what, uh, two things. One, the Naviance is the, that every student has to have an individualized plan starting in sixth grade, so that's what that is. But you're still right about that piece. We, we are doing power school, but we're doing out of some expenditures from this year, correct? Yes. And yes, we do have to report that data. I want to remind you, the board right now that every teacher, every grade, has got to be reported, this is crazy, to the state, to the commission. And that's what you're talking about. That is still a requirement. And we are able to do that. We can do that. Um, 
I don't know. I'm going to, we're supposed to be able to do that. I think it's going to be somewhat difficult, but we have the power, we have the power school equipment. Uh, personnel, we're going to have to get some assistance, but I think we have, we have to do it. We don't have much of a choice. We have to do it. But that's in the budget. You're correct. I mean, I'm sorry, that's in the requirement where we budgeted this year. We're, we're going to have to do it and we're going to do it. Yeah, and we have to rearrange personnel to do it. Um, you know, things like, um, you know, where, my, where, where does money come from? When you start this budget process, as Shirley said, you know, we use it for 12% in, it's a guesstimate on the, that, and then you keep working at one year went up, one the other way. That scared me, but it did go the other way. Um, you have grants that we, we pay for, we have to have in-kind um, contributions, and sometimes we will have personnel in there. Now those grants, side of it is funded by the feds or the state, then there's money in there from benefits sometimes that we don't have to expend because we save this. So that goes into the general fund. That's how we start a pure, a curing, curing, curing more money as we go through the budget. Sometimes we expend more. You may recall when we had the early retirement, we anticipated the people all taking for, um, uh, full, full benefits, but we were amazed that only half of them needed full-time benefits. So we saved all that money, we were able to purchase that year, I think there were books and things that we couldn't buy, we bought with that money. So things happen. Sometimes they happen the other way, but that's how things come about sometimes. <coughs> yeah. Sam, so I have, I have just a general question about budget, how the budget works. Um, in the budget, do you, does it reflect um, positions that haven't been filled? And if so, how many? And does that include um, benefits and those numbers also? Do you anticipate? And which, which ones? The, the retirement? The re the retirement, we, we just figure out that they are uh, salaries because we've all taken benefits. So we're just moving all over them. Now we may hire somebody who has uh, only uh, single, so we save some money on the side, but we don't know that now. So we leave the benefits in as it is now. We just move out the salary. So for, ex for example, like teaching positions, like if you have um, you know, 300 teaching positions and you, you only have 250, is that reflected in the budget that you have those, do you know what I'm asking, those positions yeah. in the budget, and if so, do they help? If there are teaching classroom teaching positions, those are presumably all full right now, either with a long-term sub because someone's out on leave, um, so we anticipate them coming back, or um, by a current employee. So all of those move forward in the budget when we talk about moving everything forward, and then we have allotted a certain number of positions to accommodate the enrollment increase for next year. Um, so those pieces are all firmly in the budget. Um, positions that are otherwise unfilled, I'm hard pressed to think of any right now, um, you know, other kinds of positions. The easiest one that comes to mind are the classroom people because they're either there or they're not there. So, okay. um, but that's the most obvious example. Mr. Okay. Mm -hmm. and the savings that you negotiated for the health insurance, does that transfer or help the city in any way? I assume the city would would sit as well. Are they able to get a benefit or negotiate or renegotiate? Well, they, uh, we have a separate plan for the city, so they have to negotiate themselves. Are they aware of the success that you had so that maybe they would be? We just got it at 1130, 1145 this afternoon, so two council members are there, so they... So they'll pass it on? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're always looking to help you guys, you know that. <laughs> You know, for the board's notice here, there are two, there are two um, things that are outstanding here. We, we have a bid that I think um, may be a little bit better than the signal plan. you got to remember that when you have, when we switch from one plan A to plan B, whatever it is, the board has the authority to do that, but you have to do a matching, and that is, that is a, tr a tremendous amount of work, and it cannot guarantee that they will match. So unless it's a substantial difference, you don't generally, you know, make a transfer into another carrier. We're still waiting for Blue Cross Blue Shield. You know, we may be sitting here, and I don't know, you know, they may want your business back and make another offer, but it has to be substantial. So I don't know if that's come in. I've been waiting all day for that one as well. But those are the only two variables 
I can see that we're going to have problems. Along with, I think the point is well taken. The 1.7, what if it's not there? You know, and that's what I'm saying to you. It's there with the city assisting us to get there. The other variable would be the bus contract. If for some reason um, the state of Connecticut, the state of Connecticut doesn't get a waiver, we may have to still move kids across town, so we may have to get a bus. That stuff I don't know. You know, I'm making some assumptions on those things. Um, we're getting more money for magnet schools. Now, the current revenue here reflects the more money, correct? I'm looking at Joe because we just there's two uh, two items. One. Uh, one is the more money that we're receiving at the same rate with more, more children. The second one is that the uh, governor has put in an extra money for for to help the districts. So that's again under that is SB 24. So that's all in there. Correct. Um, just so the board's information, I think the um, Magnet School, as you know, we um, we receive around three thousand for every one of our students. And we have a contribution from the out of out of district students with about 150, about 150 students, or about 1,800 from each ascending district. Then the state reimburses as well, um, and that's gone up this year from 382 students next year to 423. 432. 401. 32. 432 students. So that increase allowed, you know, we're trying to treat the night school the same way with the number of students in classes. And, but it's, and I keep saying, the Magnus School has been a resource generating activity for the district in a lot of ways. So, um, you know, now if the more money gets in there, then we you know, that's what this reflects. But that's all part of the reform package. And I think what's going to happen, I think you may hear someone say, you know, we're not moving forward until, until we negotiate something else. So we might not have a budget in a week or two, even though the session may come to an end. So, you know, sometime before July 1st, we should have a budget for the state, I would hope. Sam, um, did you think about reinstating any of the um, electives that have been cut at the high school or reinstating tech ed in the middle schools? Or did that play a part at all in your decision-making process? Uh, the high school one is one that we talked about, Sandy. And, um, when I, and I, we have not added any more in the elective areas. We um, we have let electives move ahead, even though we didn't have the number of students that we would want to qualify. For example, we had in some courses uh, third in the sequence. They should have between 14 and 18 students because the kids, the youngsters, started as freshmen. That we have an obligation to give them the last one in the sequence, we let go. Um, we have not reduced the high school anymore, but we have not increased it anymore. So it, we, I didn't, did not discuss with the high school ahead. And I've asked Dr. Glass to go up there and work with the students as they have a course selection to see where they're at. And as of yesterday, when we talked about it, I don't think we have a schedule to know if we have to add any. Um, but I have not added FTEs. Two years ago, we were going to reduce some FTEs, and we did not do that. We, um, we, we kept the FTEs at the high school. We, we are going to add the science uh, because uh, of the lab part. We have the three, the three science teachers in there that um, we're going to add. We're also going to look at redeploying some FTEs out of the way we do our um, our credit recovery so that we can add some sectioning in some of the areas as well. So that's how we're doing some internal stuff. But there are three new teachers. Is it three for the high school for science? Probably two science, one ELL. Two science, one ELL at the high school. So, it's done at the middle school. Uh, yes, the middle school uh, we added. Um, well, you might want to explain how it works. STEM, but not, not. Well, STEM is part of it. But not, not the tech ed. No, not, not like the tech ed. Skills and those, those That's classes. correct. We didn't reduce, one of the recommendations reduced the language, world language, French. We didn't do that. It doesn't, we're not going to do that. But we didn't reinstate the, um, the family and consumer science. No, we did not. We did not restate industrial technology. In fact, so the board knows this, we're using those work that room to, to the space that we have for the students. 
that have been occupied, but we, we don't have that in his recommendation. Is that correct? We didn't, we didn't consider it, actually. The only thing we talked about was the world language at the middle school. I know you talked with the middle school principals. If, you know, I just want to make sure that we're walking on a semi-dangerous path, not to be overly dramatic. But it looks like, um, once again, through hard work, we've been able to pull it off. But it does go back to what Shirley said. It does go back to what Phyllis said. Um, this is not the same school system this was four years ago. We've been seriously hurt. And if folks out in the community we think we haven't been, and somehow we're playing some kind of smoke and mirrors kind of game, it's not true. And as you know, Sandy's question, have you added this back, really ties into Phyllis's question. We, part of our value added that didn't show up was the gifted and talented and wanting to increase. There will be kids at the high school next year and the middle school that will not have books. It's guaranteed. Because that's part of the value added to put back in there. Our curriculum development will be slowed down again, which we were cited for by the Cambridge group. Our staff development, we're trying to pull up an arrangement with the 1.7 that Sal mentioned. But we, just today, we had a $150 need in terms of professional development at the high school. And we're trying to figure out how to do it because it's, we must do it. But we're more than $1,000 overdrawn on that account. So these, these issues um, are things that we're blowing over. Every, we've had three capital meetings this week just on this same topic. So we've tried to make, you know, let's say apples to lemonade out of lemons. But there are things that have fallen through the cracks that it will not be resurrected. Those literacy teachers at the elementary level, they lost 17, it really hurt the school system. We have never been able to recover from that. We've never been able to recover from the cut in the paraprofessionals that we lost. Each time we go down this path, we try to take a very difficult situation and make the best of it that we can, but we are not the same school system we were four years ago. Anne Rose. Since Mr. Malone has already addressed, can I ask him a question again? Yes? Is that okay? Okay. Um, Mr. Holly had asked you a question, and I'm not sure I understood the answer, so I'm going to ask it again, and I apologize if you answered it and uh, just wasn't connecting with me. Um, I understand the Head Start program is a state, federal, and locally funded. I get that. And I also understand different cities contribute different amounts and different cities receive different amounts of money from the state. The question that I thought he asked was, was there anything that you, I guess, I don't want to say you personally, but you could do to increase the funding from the state to Head Start? Because I'm wondering, this is my wonderings, um, I feel as if Danbury has done such an amazing job in supporting the program for the past, what, 30 years. Um, and I feel that maybe because we've done, so, done such an amazing job, we haven't gotten our fair share, so to speak, from the state. And if we didn't do such an amazing job, maybe we would have, we would have had received more monies from them. So. And because we're not a school district like we used to be four years ago, I'm trying to put this all together and say, if the local budget did not support Head Start, is there a place for you to go? Because would they pick up the pieces? And if they wouldn't, why wouldn't they? The answer, the answer to your question is, that we get proportionally from the feds and from the state the same amount of money as all other Head Start programs, okay? So no, we are not underfunded by the feds or anybody else, okay? What this, you are correct, the city of Danbury has done a specially good job in supporting its Head Start program. I actually think it's coming up to more than 35 years. I think we're getting close to 40 years. I think it was 1965, someone said, thank you. 65. So we're coming up to 40 years. Right? What? And, and the local program has had its ups and downs. Okay. But right now it's clearly on a huge up. All right. In terms of the quality of the program and everything else, we can we can go through that if you want. But the reason that the difference between a, a town that that really supports Head Start 
and a town that does not uh, is the amount of resources you can put into the classroom. Okay? You have put those resources into the classroom. That's what produces the results of the kids in the classroom. Okay? A lot of towns try to skate by. They have one staff person. They try to do it with uh, a half-time second person or volunteers or parents. Or this. There are other ways of meeting the two, human, the two adults in the classroom. Okay? But you don't, get, you, I get you don't get the quality. I know, I get you, don't, you don't get the quality. So what Danbury has done is Danbury has invested in that quality. Okay? Now, the second answer to your question, and, and I think in the last five years, the program has returned the favor. Okay, the program really has been, I, I can go through the whole history for you sometime, personally, whatever. But uh, the whole the program has been entirely revamped in the last five years, okay? And that's what's produced the, the changes and the results and the federal review and the scoring and all that kind of good stuff, all right? Your question is, is there, can we get more money out of the state, okay? I, there's two answers to the question. One is no in terms of Head Start in a sense, okay? In other words, the state is not looking to put more money into Head Start. If you go through the state budget, by the way, there are Head Start line items. There's no increase in the Head Start line items, okay? Is there another way? And the answer is potentially yes, and that's what I was alluding to. The SB24 is under negotiation, right? That's where it stands. It's under negotiation. And we're actually hoping that there might be some language in SB 24 that would be added to be a little more supportive of Head Start. There is an element in the plan, there's an element in the plan that says uh, we'll take consideration of your preschool uh, efforts. It would be nice if that specifically identified Head Start. Yes, Head Start is a preschool effort, so I think the language kind of covers it, but it would be even better if it were specifically called out. And uh, there are legislators, including legislators from Danbury, who are working on that. But I can't guarantee that, obviously. But that would be a nice thing. And that would make the superintendent's job easier, because if it turns out it's 1.75, and that language was there, boy, that would be a home run. Okay? So yes, there are things that can be done. The most important thing that can be done at the state level, and you know this because you've said it, the most important thing that can be done at the state level is to change the ECS formula so that Danbury gets its fair share. I think it's a, a, a perfectly valid case can be made that Danbury does not get its fair share of ECS money. And, and that would be the big thing. That money comes to you, you can spend it as you want. It's not categorical money, right? So that's the single most important thing that can be done at the state level. And, and anything I can do to help do that, I'm certainly eager to do. Uh, Mrs. Maloney uh, has a veto. She's exercised it. Yes, as, as long as you're up. Yes, um, you said earlier that all the city money that goes to Head Start goes to personnel. Yes, sir. Um, now, are, are those city employees, and you have other employees that work directly for you and are not through yes. the city? Yes, yes. All the, the Board of Ed handles the classroom component of Head Start, okay? At least most of the classroom component of Head Start. And that's where you put your money, and those are the classroom staff, right? There is other money, and, and we, we write a check to the Board of Ed, total checks of about $750,000 a year. That, that comes out of our federal grant and goes over to the Board of Ed for that, okay? It's about, it's about a 50-50 ratio. The Board puts in about half, we put in about half. That's the education component. There are three classrooms that are, uh, in addition to the 14 classrooms you staff, all right, so you've got 28 classroom staff plus seven program aides, I think, um, and one uh, education coordinator, okay? Those are your staff, and it basically handles 14 classrooms. There are three other classrooms. Uh, two are at, um, one's at, uh, excuse me, one is at uh, Laurel Gardens, and the other two are at St. Peter's, that are funded by a combination of state resources and school readiness, okay? Then there is the parent component of the program. The parent component of the program is run by the Head Start program directly. In other words, we don't, we don't give you money and you run the parent component. We keep money for the parent component and run that component. And that's what I said. We have reduced staff there. We have cut administrative costs. That's how we have, with no increase in money, how we have absorbed the increases in costs that we've experienced just as you have over the last several years. OK, thank you. Well,
the people that were left, we took them out of the high school and turned those back into classrooms. And then when we added with Ann the Parent Literacy Center over at Osborne, we took the remaining few people over there, Kathy knows, but she was over there, and those were very tiny offices, and we took those people and put them over at CRC as well. If we had a second floor on Beaverbrook, or if we took the boardroom and chopped it up into cubicles, we could put them there. That's the kind of thing that they came out. That's it, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that before I have to vote on this budget, that we'll have, remember my question about the value add, you're going to read you that list so I know exactly what I'm doing? Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll get that to you. I'll get that to you. Thank you again. I'm going to just do something that's, um, I just talked to Dr. Glass and asked, so I'm not. Um, there was conversation with me, um, with different people from the city during the course of the last week or two about Head Start and my feelings about it, and I expressed my feelings about it. And the comeback, the comeback was um, that there seems to be a lot of uh, publicity lately about how ineffective Head Start may be after a certain period of time. I asked Dr. Glass to clarify that for me. He could explain it, and he did it so succinctly. I'd like him, asked him if he could do it publicly. Would you do that, sir? Yeah, sure. Um, there have been a lot of uh, editorials coming, or uh, letters to the editor, not only in Denver, but in other places. Uh, when economic times get tough, the question then comes up. I'm hearing things about it starts, starts off with a bang and it kind of fizzles out by the middle of elementary school. There's some truth to that, and there's a fallacy with that as well. Um, most of the research studies say Head Start makes a significant difference as long as it's maintained. Meaning, if you have kids with a 1 to 10 ratio, if you have a full day program, if you have parental support, and then they come into a full day kindergarten program, they're paraprofessionals, for example, materials, there's active parent engagement, and then it continues on through first grade, second grade, third grade, it stays, the traction stays. If it comes in and the kids have this rich program and then they hit, say, and I hope this doesn't come out saying like a, a, a kind of manipulates anything, but if you come into a universal half-day kid program without paraprofessionals and you have 22 or 23 kids in the room and you don't have ample resources, you're going to lose the momentum you picked up. Thank you. If I could, could I just elaborate on that very, very briefly? You've been, you've been very generous in allowing me to comment, and I appreciate it very much. The, um, I think every member of the board received over the course of the year a copy of this article, which is um, an article by uh, Dr. Kathleen McCartney, who is the dean of the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, and. Um, uh, she makes, first of all, the point that uh, Dr. Glass just made, which is it's a little bit analogous to summer break. Yeah, a kid comes out of the second grade or the seventh grade or the tenth grade and doesn't do anything for the summer and comes back, and guess what? Uh, something has faded. Um, the, other, the other point, again, that Dr. Glass made is that uh, the key to Head Start success has been parental involvement and only recently have the, the whole notion of parental involvement begun to be incorporated into the elementary school curriculum in a similar way. So it's not that Ed, Head Start doesn't work, is that the public schools haven't continued to build on Head Start the way that we would like to see it happen. Even said, two final points, even said, that's the average program. That's the average program. Denver does not have an average program. 5% of the programs in the United States of America score as well as the Danbury program. We're in the top 5%, right? So the average doesn't apply to us to begin with. Second point, let me just read this in terms of the ultimate payoff for Head Start. This is with the existing situation, the existing uh, summer fall off, the existing problems of uh, non-continuity. David Deming, professor from the Carnegie Mellon University, conducted a clever evaluation. This is from Dr. McCartney's article. A clever evaluation of Head Start by comparing siblings, one who experienced Head Start and one who did not. So a pretty good sample control. 
yes, no. Right? Um, his findings show that Head Start children score higher on a measure of young adult success that includes higher high school graduation rates, higher college attendance rates, less idleness, less crime teen, uh, less teen crime, less teen parenthood, and better health status. And the effect is large. In fact, Head Start closes one third of the gap between children from families with median incomes and those with broader quartile incomes. Okay? So not only, yes, it, it may fade a little bit the way you're talking about in the summer, okay? but it has such a profound effect. It shows up in terms of high school graduation rates, college attendance rates, less crime. So um, one of you ladies, please stand up. Stand up. Head Start means stronger schools. That, that, that's not a slogan, that's a fact. As, as uh, Patrick Moynihan, who was a US senator and a very internationally renowned um, social scientist said, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. Okay, Head Start works. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Long. Mr. Long. Uh, Kirk, you mentioned parental involvement. Yes, sir. And I go to a number of PTO meetings. And parental involvement seems very low. Um, you seem to be quite good at uh, getting a crowd out. You think you've worked in some PTO meetings? <laughs> uh, organization is always a good thing, sir. Uh, the uh, but the, um, the the parental involvement. I'm not an educator. Okay, I'm an attorney. Okay, so excuse me. All right, because I'm now going to go on to waters that aren't my own. But parent, parental involvement is not coming to meetings. Okay? Parental involvement is learning how to teach your child at home, how to support what's going on in the classroom, how to work with the teacher. And these are, these are teachable skills. That's what the family advocates from the Head Start program do. That's the difference between Head Start and school readiness and daycare, is the family advocate program teaches parents how to develop their kids. And that's why the effect lasts through high school and into college. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. We would like to close this portion of our meeting. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes break, and I recommend board we can start at 7.30. Okay? So we'll be back at the table, so we can adjourn early December. Okay, thank you.